Alrighty. Cool. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is JP, and welcome on this afternoon session. Hopefully, you're not all going to fall asleep after lunch, but let's see how it goes. Um, if you fall asleep, that's okay. Um, we'll try and move along. I think that lovely noise out there will probably keep you awake as long as my dulcet tones. So um, this, is a, this is intended to be a workshop. So again, if you have a laptop, um, please do feel free to follow along. Um, but you can just do this afterwards at home, um, or you can just watch me talk and make typos and so on. So we've got an hour and a half, I believe. Um, so if you have any questions along the way, please feel free to let me know, and we can just have a conversation as we go. So primarily, I've, this, I've set this up through a uh, Jupyter Notebook. So this is a Jupyter Notebook with slides in it that we've set up as a, as a slideshow. Um, how many of you can I get a hands up if you are Python familiar or Python developers? Fabulous. OK, let's, let's get going then. Cool. Um, if you do want to follow along, there's the repository address and the QR code, which is also a shortcut. So let's get started. Um, my name is JP. I work for a company called Weaviate, and we make this database product called Weaviate. So it's an open source um, vector database or AI native database. It's been around for five years or so. Um, we're really proud of it, and um, we think it performs really well and scales well and so on. But so uh, we're going to be using that as the primary database today. This is what we're going to do. So we're going to go through some examples of AI powered searches. You're going to create and build our own vector database. We're going to perform some searches and perform retrieval augmented generation. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about scalability considerations because it's all good and well to talk about, hey, this is a demo, we can build demos. But it's also really cool to talk about how these things scale and what are some of the things you want to think about as you scale. As part of that repo, you'll see this demo that's interesting. So this is a little Streamlit app that I've put together. And you can see I've pre-populated my database with 100,000 rows of data. Um, so don't worry too much about the front end side of things. But what it is, is a database of Twitter um, conversations from a few years back. And it's basically conversations from all these different accounts um, of you know, customer support on Twitter talking to users. And this is probably a typical kind of use case for using your own data and doing analysis with retrieval augment generation, right? Um, so after today, you will be experts at using a vector database. And if you have your own data like this, unstructured data like this, you can perform searches and manipulate your data to do things like this. So you can say, oh, I want to have a look at some data to do with you know, an account with Amazon in it, in which case it might be most likely this Amazon help account. And then I want to say, I, I might say, oh, I want to see what conversations people have had about, say, returns or late something or other. And I can retrieve a certain number of results. And I can instantly get through my data set and retrieve these types of results. So this one's coming up. That's interesting. So it talks about contact JP customer service. That's not me. Um, but this is coming up in the search because the word late appears in our query. So in the past, if you had data sets like this and you found entries that are relevant, you might be man reviewing these manually and you might have some analysts say, oh, what are some of the patterns I see in my data? But instead, uh, with retrieval augment generation, I can get these search, search results and say things like, what types of issues are mentioned here? And I can generate a response. While that's happening, this is a little bit slower because all of this is running on my local machine using Olama. So the searches um, that you see here are happening live using an Olama-based uh, local nomic embedding model on my laptop. And the generation afterwards is happening using a Gemma model, a fairly small Gemma model. It's, you know, it's, a, it's not like an amazing, super powerful laptop. It's, it's pretty good, but you know, it's, it's no supercomputer. And then you can see that out of these searches um, that are performed, it's manipulating or it's analyzing those results so that I can get these uh, summaries and transform the results from our raw searches. So this is where we're going. And this is a little bit of preview to hopefully say, oh, that's kind of interesting. I can do 
all sorts of interesting things with my data, and hopefully it'll whet your appetite a little bit for the workshop. Cool. But let's go back to our slides. So these are some of the things you'll see. Hopefully, through this exercise, you'll get to learn a little bit about, hey, what are these different types of searches, right? What are vector searches, keyword, and hybrid searches? When to use each one, because hopefully you'll understand what they are and how to use them. We'll also talk about how to perform retrieval augmented generation, which really combines those types of searches with uh, the power of language models. And of course, how to build a vector database that'll power a lot of these operations. Cool, let's talk a little bit about search. Um, let's start with searches, because searches are really behind a lot of what we do these days in terms of getting value out of data. So this is an obviously extremely, extremely small data set, um, a toy data set of, of dogs and animals. And if you have a look at this uh, Jupyter script, um, this is just something I'm prepared so we can run searches. So don't worry about that content at all. But once I've done that, we can start to run some queries. So here's an example of a traditional keyword search. Can you see that kind of at the middle-ish back? Sweet. Um, so let's say we search through our data set for a query term like cat. Remember this was a six or seven object data set of um, animals and slight descriptors. So if I search the word cat, I get the entry for small domestic black cat. Makes sense? Sorry? How does it know it? How does it? Aha, uh -huh. well at this moment, we're just doing a keyword search and I'll go through the details of searches in a bit, but at the moment I'm just searching for the word cat and because there's the same uh, word that appears in the cat, so that's what's happening, yeah. And then um, we'll see, that's a really good sort of starting point to say, well, it's a keyword match, so it makes sense that it returns that. Traditional searches though are not particularly robust. So here's a simple use case. So let's say if I make a typo, right? Do Oops, since it's in presentation mode, I gotta run the cell differently. So if I run that, I get zero results because I've made a typo and that exact word doesn't appear. Same thing with kitten or so. I get no results. So it's not a very flexible type of search. And this is where vector search comes in handy. Vector search um, have you used vector search before? Can I get hands up? Nope. Some? Okay. I <laughs> see, maybe. Um, vector search, another phrase for it is uh, semantic search or similarity search. So what it does is it extracts some sort of meaning from your objects and it performs searches that allow you to be more contextually sensitive and give you a little bit more nuance, which is really, really cool. So sure, if I perform a search, a uh, similar search, for cat, I get these results, and the top result here is still what we might expect, right? Something to do with cats. You also notice that there's additional results. So the second result here involves cheetahs, which is kind of in the, you know, cat family, um, and so on. So we'll talk more about this as well, but now let's try variations of the term, like kitten or something. And I have to stop pressing the wrong buttons. Um, if I run a search for kitten, I still get as a top result something about a cat. Even though the word kitten doesn't appear in my data anywhere or any, indeed any of these other terms. And that is the power of using vector search. It understands that the kitten, that a kitten, is essentially the same thing as a cat and it's able to pull out the relevant results. And as a consequence, what that gives you is a more forgiving search. Oh, before I go on, I can even um, uh, who's, oh my gosh, sorry. Um, hopefully, if you're, is that correct, French? Uh, sorry, sorry. Um, but you get the idea. <laughs> it's able to understand, even though I've made a horrible typo in a different language, pull out the correct result, or the most appropriate results. But, so I've demonstrated in a little bit of a hand wavy way that a vector search works, but what is a vector? So let's talk a little bit about that. What 
uh, vectors. A vector really is just a set of numbers. That's, that's all there is to it. Um, you might hear explanations that make it very, very technical, but really a vector at the end of the day is an array or a list of numbers. And it could be as simple as a couple of integers or binary, what have you, or it could be a very long list up to 3,000 or so of floating point integers or floating point numbers, I should say. Why does any of this matter? Because they can represent meaning. And what does that mean exactly? Let's have a look at a different example. You're probably all familiar with RGB numbers, right? You know, we're familiar with RGB type systems. You have three numbers, typically, you know, 8-bit integers, and you use those three integers to represent colors, right? So if you're red, it's 25500, and if you're salmon, some other numbers, and so on. So if you can, in that context, you can think of each number as a little dial for how red, how green, and how blue something is. Hopefully that, you're still with me in that, in that context. And again, slightly hand wavy, but if you just extend that concept of using three numbers to represent a color, let's say you have a lot more of these dials. So instead of three, you might have 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 numbers. And instead of a eight bit integer, you might have a floating point number, right? And that gives you a lot of variability to encode meaning. And that's why we use vectors to represent meaning. What I haven't covered here is how that meaning gets encoded into those floating point numbers. And that's where deep learning models come in. They get trained to come up with these numbers that represent meaning. So that similar meaning ends up closer together. Um, but, you know, really getting into deep learning space. And for someone like me who uses these things, these things a lot, um, that kind of gets abstracted away because all I need to do is to select a model and use it to get my vectors. So that's all there is to it. So if you look at these different sentences, so I'm Australian. Um, these are fairly Australian sort of titles, at least the uh, uh, news headlines, the, at least the first couple. Um, so you can get any, of, any phrases, any text, any word, what have you, and convert it into a vector, and it just turns into a series of numbers. And the numbers are not important, but what is important is that once you do that, similar numbers end up closer together. So, and that allows us to perform vector searches because similar numbers end up close, similar meaning um, ends up closer in numbers, and therefore once you perform vector search, you can find objects with the most similar meaning. So that's vector search. That's what a vector is. Why use this thing? Um, one is it's a better search tool in some ways, in that you can find more contextually relevant information. You can use synonyms, languages, different languages. So it ultimately helps you to get more out of your data because you can find relevant objects. Another really big use case that's really exploded in the last couple of years is that it's an amazing tool that helps you to work with generative AI and language models. And we've all, hopefully, I think most of us have used language models now, and a big problem that they have still to this day is that they hallucinate and they're not really able to have access to your latest information or your grounded information, like if you have proprietary database and so on your language model doesn't have access to that. So that's why vector search works really well because it helps you to find up-to-date information and from your proprietary database. So this system where you might send a prompt to a language model and you get something back which may or may not be truthful can get augmented to retrieval augmented generation where you're not sending just your prompt to the model, you're sending your prompt and the data so they can ground the outputs in your own correct, up-to-date information. And that gives you a better chance. Again, um, at the moment, you know, language models aren't 100% um, verifiable in terms, or they're not 100% truthful, even if you send as much data as you can, but it really gives you the best chance you have at the moment of getting the best quality outputs from your models. Yep. Is the thing just embedded in, in the prompt and the prompt text below? Or? Typically, the thing to do, so you can uh, do both. You can fine tune 
your model with your data and some training sets, whatever. But in term, in the context of RAG, yeah, you're, what you're doing is finding the data you want and sending it along with your prompt to the language model. Yeah, yeah. So that's why um, with these newer kind of larger context um, models, it's easier to do. Um, so there's like whole discussion to be had about, you know, if you have like a gigantic, let's say 200,000 token context window, can you just send all the data you have to it? Um, but I think I've seen a lot of studies that say that the models don't really do well in that scenario where you give it too much data, especially where there's like irrelevant info. But yeah, um, short answer. Yes, you do send the prompt and the search results. And that's a really good question because that really gets to the heart of why you need retrieval, uh, why you need search and the retrieval part of retrieval augmented generation because your databases are quite big, right? Like if I did talk like this, you know, um, I have a quote unquote big database uh, in my demo with 100,000 objects or not, but that's in the scheme of things quite small, right? You might have 100 million objects, billion objects or so on. So how do you find the right objects and the right data to send to your uh, model along with your prompt? And that's why search is very, very important. You need the right search <laughs> tools and you need to perform the, have the right search strategy so you can send the right context to the model with the job that you want performed. So, and these are the typical RAG prompts, right? So you might have your language model to say things like, oh, what's the corporate strategy of Acme Co? Or, you know, what's my internal policy on food expenses? Important for someone like me who travels a lot. Um, if you're a smartphone company doing customer service or analysis, you might have you know, millions of rows of reviews and customer feedback from different places, and you want to do some pattern recognition. So you might want to do all of these different things, and is it, is, is it easy and feasible to find that data uh, just using keyword searches? It's very, very difficult. So if you have a prompt like this, or if you have a job like this, what would you search for if you had just keyword searches? How would you capture all the different uh, objects that talk about smartphone, right, that relate to smartphones? As humans, you and I know that if I say iPhone, Android, whatever, kind of same thing. But what do you do in a keyword search? Do you, you know, capture all of these different terms? How do you have a long nested set of all statements, basically? to search for these words. It's very, very hard. With vector databases, all you need to do is basically just use, have, have a phrase that captures the semantic meaning of what you want to search for, and it really makes that task easy for you to perform. So when we talk about vector databases and language models, it's not an either or situation. It's really a story of how they fit together as part of your solution stack because they have complementary um, technologies. So language models, you know, we talked about fine tuning um, that can do things like help your language model in a case of a chatbot, speak in your uh, brand voice and so on, and p transform your objects and your information. When you talk about vector databases, it's really about giving you the best tools to retrieve the exact information or the most relevant information for your task. Cool. Uh, Okay, now that I've talked about all of that, let's do some uh, live coding. Cool. We're gonna start by building a database. So um, I'll just go through my oops, repository. So if you did go to the repository, um, we've got a GitHub organization called WeVA Tutorials, and you can have a look at this repository called Workshop OSS 24. If you walked in slightly later, um, there's a, um, what's the best way to do this? There's an opening slide here with a QR code that's a link back to that repo. So you can have a look at that. But if you go to this repo, uh, repo and if you clone it, um, it guides you through all the steps you need to work through the tutorial and the demo app. So. Um, tells you to install Python instead of a virtual environment, and so on. I won't go through all of that in detail. Also tells you how to set up Olama, and what that allows us to do is to use our local model for embeddings and our language model. 
and we're going to install Docker. So what I'm going to do, or what I am doing already, is running VV8 on this Docker, um, on, on my local computer through Docker. So that's what I'm doing. And what I will do is to skip some steps. What I'll do is to use this data set of movies. So I've got a very, very small data set to start with, or it's a relatively small data set to start with of movies. It's a CSV file. So if you run this cell, you're gonna get, you're gonna get about a, just a um, data set with a thousand rows of movies. Everyone likes movies, so I thought that might be relatable. And this is what the data looks like. So, you know, you have movies as old as like the original Cinderella, Alice in Wonderland, and so on. And there's quite a few columns, so let's work with that. To start with, let's connect to Weaviate. Um, again, in this particular workshop, I'm gonna run Weaviate on my machine, but there's a whole bunch of different options to, uh, you know, it's depending on how much you wanna um, get your hands dirty, basically, right? So you can run it on a, as a hosted cloud platform, but it's an open source library, so you can download it and run it whichever way you like. Um, or you can run it directly using Go as well, which is it's written in. So as I'm running VV8 already on my device, this is all I need to do is to, I'm running, I'm using this connect to local helper method. And sorry, I need to get out of the habit of using shift enter and use uh, command enter to run these. Um, but I'm gonna instantiate a client object like so. Cool. Um, cool. And what I'm gonna do is to run this cell and this just returns a binary um, response to see is if the um, if the database is ready or not cool so now we're connected to the database on my device and we can start to do stuff to it so let's start by adding some data in weave 8 um, or in lots of other NoSQL type databases we talk about collections and if you're not familiar with that term it's same as using tables so what we're going to do is to start uh, create a new collection here called movie and we'll configure a couple of things excuse me for changing the zoom level a few times what we're going to do is to create a couple of named vectors and what that'll do for us is gives us flexibility in how we search and we'll configure a generate sorry we'll configure a generative module which essentially just means we're going to integrate our large language model with it and we'll optionally um, define some properties to save our data. So that's gives, giving us the data structure. Cool. So you'll see quite a few lines of code, but actually most of this is comments. <laughs> the actual lines of code that matters are basically these lines of code. And here, what I'm doing is to create a collection called movie. And what I'm doing is to configure what parts of my data is converted to a vector. And I'm using a um, integration for Llama. And I'm saying, okay, so some users might want to create a uh, search by titles, right? So quite often if you go to IMDB or what have you, you might be like, oh, okay, I wanna find movies with this kind of title, right? So that's what it allows to do. And what, how it does it is to convert the title property to a vector. And this information here just tells we aviate how to find our Llama instance so they can send our data to a Llama and get data back. Question? Yep. So the model, I see you have no mech uh, mm -hmm. set. How do you know which one to use or is that? Yeah, it's a kind of big topic, right? Model selection. Um, what I typically say to people is, if you are using an API provider, right, you can, you probably can't go wrong as a starting point with one of the big, more popular model providers like your Cohere, your OpenAI's of the world, right? Um, in terms of the embedding uh, model, sorry, in, in terms of open source embedding or at least open weight embedding models, um, Nomic is kind of well known as a good one. Um, and how I know that is um, to go uh, embed, uh, 
there's a benchmark called MTEB. So this is a MTEB on Hugging Face. And if you have a look at it, they have results for uh, retrieval. So this is kind of a good place to start as to which models uh, perform well for which task. And this is kind of a good starting point. And if you have very specific needs, for example, if you have needs for different domains like medical, legal, there's usually different models that are trained for that as well. So those are kind of good, good starting points and hopefully that makes sense. Uh, yep, gentlemen at the back. Yeah. I've heard embedding before. Can you explain? Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, so were you here when we, when we talked about vectors? Yes. Okay, yeah, perfect. So, yeah, I should probably not, uh, I should be more consistent in my terminology. So when we talk about embeddings and we talk about vectors, they're basically the same things. So why we say embeddings is because um, meaning of like objects, like the movie title, gets embedded or uh, added to those vectors. So these embedding models um, basically convert or extract the meaning of words, you know, images even, into vectors. And another way to, at a very, very high level, I like to think about it as like a translator, you know, translating from text or whatever language into deep learning or however you want to think about it, computers. Hope that, hope that makes sense? Cool, yeah. Yep. Models are trained using vectors, did you say? Yeah. Yeah, so they output vectors. And do the vectors you use for the search need to be the same, like, in the same language? So, yeah, that's a really good question about what models to use when. Um, when you're using an embedding model, what, I'm, what we're going to do here is to configure an embedding model so that when you add, when I add data to the database, um, we've yet uses this model to convert the objects that I add into vectors. And then when I perform searches, I have to use that exact same model because it'll be like, you know, asking a person who only speaks English uh, a question in, you know, Korean or something. Um, so that's the model, that's the consistency in model required for searches. Later on here, I also specify what generative model to use, which is another word that we use for a large language model. Um, you'll see I've got a different model for doing this, which is a very small Gemma, uh, meta Gemma model. Um, that's completely decoupled from embedding. So I can use whichever model I want for that second step, because as we talked about, all we're doing is grabbing results from the database and then sending it to a language model. And that's not in vectors, that's in text. That's correct, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, yeah, this is if you can think of, if you think of this generative step as if you had a very like a very manual way to do it would be if you had a you know junior person at your office that you want to torture and get them to search through a million uh, pages of documents, copy and paste all the text into ChatGPT. It's essentially what we're doing through a database. So yeah, that's in text. Um, please don't do that to your junior person. That'll be very, that'll be very sad. Okay, the good questions. Um, so let's say, so here, what we're gonna do is configure our database so that when we um, add objects, the title of those objects are gonna be converted to vectors and that'll be really good. But there's also a lot of other good information in like the movie summary, right? Like the title might not always tell you a lot about the movie. <coughs> so let's configure another vector. So I'm going to just copy and paste that and let's call it um, all text and this is just a name of our vector. Yep? Uh, can I translate it also to field name? When I'm, when, when I'm going to other search engines, yeah, normally you say field name is uh, content is by set. It's like a field name. Yeah, so in this case you'll see it when, when I use, so this is saying um, if you've used search engines, like you're saying, um, open searches, yeah, and you can say, oh, only look in this field. So that's essentially the same thing, but this will contain a vector. So yeah, same kind of concept. And we'll see that when we, when we use it in, in practice as well. Yeah, but yeah, this, the concept is exactly correct. So instead of saying, hey, get the um, data or the source, source data from just the title, 
I'm gonna add, um, I think it's called overview, yeah, overview to it. But everything else you see is the same. I'm using the nomic embedding model or so on. So that's fine. And um, Yeah, I'm going to use both, yeah. And what that'll allow me to do is to either search the title or search the like title and the overview. I can even do both as well and then just get the, have some way of pulling the results. That's really cool. Now you'll see that I've got some definitions of properties down here, um, which is commented out. Um, so you can choose to choose your own adventure here. You can define the data schema strictly, or you can just have it infer uh, have it be inferred when you import the data, and that's all fine. So the data is in pretty good shape, so this is fine. Um, but maybe in production, you want to be more strict about your data schema. Cool. Let's run that. And that should be fine. I'm going to keep on zooming out. So, okay, cool. So that's run fine. Uh, the, sorry, yeah. You, you talk about database. At the end of the day, it's a file base. No, it's it's a it's a database. Um, uh, no, it's it's. I mean, I guess there's files in the database at the end. You know, at the end of the day, um, but no, it's a distributed database. So I'm running a distributed database on my computer. So it's not very distributed for this demo, but in production, uh, you know, you might run it through Kubernetes, right, and have it distributed across multiple uh, nodes, pods, depending on how you want to think about it. Similar concept. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, normally with the other one, you needed to actually use instruct to create a chunk and then feed it, but I don't see any steps here. So is that because uh, the framework we're using already can do that? Or? So I haven't ingested any data yet. So I've created the um, the collection, which kind of like okay, defines yeah, what we want to do. Yes. But there's a, I guess, one thing that is convenient with Weaviate, you will see, is that we're not going to create any vectors manually. So in some of the other, with some of the other databases, you have to create the vectors yourself and uh, send that to your database along with the, you know, all the text and all the objects. With Weaviate, because we have defined the model to use and the, uh, you know, we're using Olama and we're using, uh, we've specified the endpoint to get the vector from. So you don't need to worry about getting the vectors because we will we'll go, oh, I haven't got a vector. I've got these specifications for how to get it or where to get it from. So we'll just kind of do that. Um, so it's a, you know, quality of life feature. And um, yeah. So this is now one time shot just to create the database. What I'm doing, uh, if I constantly get data so what we're doing is creating a collection. So in the same way that in SQL, you would create a table. We haven't ingested any data yet, right? So we can continue on to do that. The database remains uh, searchable and you can do CRUD on it, like in, in certain objects uh, and you can perform searches. It doesn't lock it in place or anything like that. And you can, and you can, sorry. So I'm, I'm, I'm a Linux guy. Does it mean that I need to run a cron job every five minutes, whatever? build the database new or to, to put the new information inside the database? Uh, no, I mean, um, so do you mean in production you would just get new more, more data? Yes. Uh, yeah, you can just have a pipeline to do that, but your data, you don't need to take the database down or anything. It's the same as any other database. The database just runs, remains operational, and as you get data, new data, you can perform your inserts or updates or deletions or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. So, um, so, oh my goodness, sorry. Um, so if I run that code, I can now see that I've got a collection, great. So now I'd like to actually add some data. So we're gonna add objects, essentially it's, you know, same as creating rows in SQL to our data. Um, this is a very, very simple example. So I'm cr creating an object to interact with my collection and I'm gonna insert, I wanted to insert like an obviously fake movie so I can distinguish it from real entries um, of that. So all I'm doing is I've got just a JSON or dictionary object and I'm adding that to my database and I'll remember to use command. Nope. <laughs> and I know it's been inserted correctly because I've got a UUID 
back. So I've got a database. Um, and how do I now check the size of my collection? Well, because I'm in Python, so I'll just run a length. So I've got one object, very big, very exciting. So we've got a database. Cool. So, but, and what if you have multiple objects? Well, you can add another method. You can add it using another method. I love it when um, <laughs> IntelliSense doesn't work on Jupyter. So what I'm doing here is just this is just a dictionary um, list comprehension, making multiple objects, and I'm going to add that. So again, in no time at all, I've added a bunch of objects. So obviously, extremely toy examples, but all you need to add data is just that payload. And notice that I haven't gotten any vectors anywhere. I haven't had to deal with you know long thousand number long floating point numbers and so on. And if I check the size of the movies collection again, I get, I've got six objects. We're getting there. Okay, but in real life, we're gonna have a bunch of data objects. So what do we do? We can use batch imports. So we're gonna just look through our data again and remind ourselves what the data looks like. Um, and these are the columns that we'll use. So, you know, let's add a build a database with a title, overview, year release, and how popular something was for a bunch of movies. I think it's like a thousand or so from 1950. And let's see how we can go. So again, you don't need to worry so much about the syntax in this uh, workshop if you're following along, but if you do want to, you can follow along, um, mm -hmm. but there's documentation in the, in the links. So what I've done is to set up a context manage manager in Python and really, I'm just iterating through the data frame. And then I can say, <coughs> let's see how I go without IntelliSense. That could be dangerous. By just adding that line, um, I can ingest data into my database, and it'll just send batches of data to that whenever it reaches a certain set or certain size. And what's happening again in this case, I've got about a thousand rows of data. And as I add data to my database, it's going to also send those objects to my local Olama instance. And the vectors along with the source objects are getting, uh, getting added to VB8. So this is, this is a live counter and live vectorization that is happening to those objects. It's, it's pretty good considering that I'm running this on my laptop and I'm creating these vectors in real time. Um, if you want to run this with a better machine or if you had a, you know, access to a faster API or whatever, this would be faster. Do you have a question? Yeah, the size of the vector per, per grid is literally just these numbers. So it's like number of width in seconds times width of integer. The size of each like vector. Each vector yeah. like so, the space over there. so it depends on the model. Um, I believe typically they're about about a thousand to three thousand um, floats is typically what you get, but the length is always the same. Like so, regardless of whether you vectorize just one word, or like the maximum, you know, uh, tokens of maximum window length, you're going to get the same output vector. It's so that they are comparable to each other. So, but typically, yeah, um, thousand to three thousand floats is what you what you need. Cool. So we've done some stuff. Let's see uh, whether this wor worked. So when I check the movies, object length, got, you know, 1,300 or so objects. That's pretty cool. So we've got a database, um, and let's see what it looks like. So what I'm going to do is look in the query namespace and use the fetch object um, method. So this is just going, I haven't got any other parameters set. This is just saying, hey, get me some objects from the database. Let's see how we go. And this is, uh, I get different objects back each time. So hopefully you're familiar with some of these movies. We've got Galaxy Quest, Clash of the Titans, and I should have three. 
I guess I must have to scroll down. Am I seeing only two movies? Or? No, okay, so there's a third one here, Memories of Murder. So I've got three movies, got a database of 1,000 objects or so. Pretty cool. And, um, and I might have taken a little while, but most of it was me yammering away. So it's pretty quick. Okay, so we've done quite a bit. So what have we done so far? This is what we've done. Um, if I can finally zoom out. Cool. We've spun up we v database on our machine, or at least on my machine, um, and we've sent some data to it without any vectors to it, right, attached to it. So we v then gone, oh, I don't have any vectors in this payload, but I want to add them. So it requests object vectors in our integration that we configured at the start. And in this particular instance, we're using a local model to get vectors back. So the object vector and the source data is populated in WeVA. So we've built a database. Um, we've populated with some numbers of objects. It's pretty cool. Yep. Um, just explain that the uh, model that's being used for creating the factors is not really dependent on the model that, uh, that you're using as an LLM. Yeah. I'm, call, I'm doing API calls to, let's go back. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, what the API call is happening to a vectorizer model, not to the generative AI model. So there's like two models attached um, to the vector database as an integration. And for the purposes of getting vectors, um, we're only ever talking to the embedding model or the vectorizer model. Yeah, good question. So in this diagram, um, the language model isn't included because we haven't worked with the language model just yet. Does that make sense? Yep. Cool. Yeah, good question. Okay, so build database, got some stuff in it. Let's uh, get some data back out. So let's start with some filters. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get our previous query and start from there <coughs> just because then it's few, less opportunities for me to start making typos. Cool, well, let's start with filters. So a filter is probably what you're most used to if you're used to SQL, right? It's the where clause in SQL. And it just reduces the number of hits based on the set criteria. So it's either in or out. I'm gonna paste my query and what I'm gonna do is make one change to it. I'm gonna add a filter. Filters equals, and this is um, kind of harrowing without um, autocomplete and ID help, but let's see how I go. Uh, so what I'm doing here is creating a filter so that I can filter the title property by some uh, partial text match. So any uh, words that I, I should do a text match for? Ideas? Okay. Let's, let's try uh, space. So this should hopefully narrow down my results so that I only show uh, partial matches where the word space is in the title. Actually, let's put wildcards there as well. There we go. Um, so we've got our fake movie, right, it's actually dominated by my fake entries, <laughs> Spongebob in vector space entries, but you get the idea, right? So if I have um, love, I get, because it's a partial match, I even get um, entries like Cloverfield because it's got the partial match love in it. You know, hopefully that's fairly self-explanatory and you're used to it, but it doesn't rank any results. So a filter just says, this meets criteria, this doesn't, and it just gets those results. And you're not gonna know which results are read first because it just reads the first ones that it sees in the database first. So what you want to do instead, if you want to take into account how significant a word is, is a keyword search. Um, who's familiar with the BM25 search algorithm? Okay, some of you, cool, that's pretty cool. So what it does, a BM25 search does, is to rank how often a particular word appears in a, in a um, string. 
versus how often it is supposed to uh, appear, so how common it is, basically. So if you've heard the terms like TF-IDF algorithm, um, like that is basically the same, well, very similar algorithm, but like a different version of it. So to do that, I'm going to copy-paste my query again. And all I will do is, instead of using this fetch objects function, I'm going to say um, dm25 and say query equals, um, what was it? Love. And if I run this, I get these results. And if I have a look at what the results are, the first one is crazy stupid love. And it's at the top because the word love appears in the title and it's only like a three word title and the word love appears at the very, uh, it's a very significant part of it, right? And if I go down and get more results, I'm gonna, let's make that six results. And then if I scroll down to it, um, we're gonna start to get results of law and war scores. I won't get into the details of the algorithm, but you can actually get the score back out so you can verify it. The way to do that, oops, sorry. The way to do that would be to um, modify my query so that I can say return metadata score is true. And then what I would do is to get metadata score Return that. Let me just move that to three. So what you'll see is to start. What you'll start to see are these scores, and that's basically the output of a BM25 search formula. Um, and now you can see that there's a natural order because it's just going in descending score of how well it matches. So that's keyword search, but it has the same problems that we talked about, right? Remember that we started the talk about using words like cat to search our toy database of animals. So if I again make a typo, which I am want to do, is you just get no results, right? Doesn't, doesn't work. So it's not a very robust search. And if I use um, synonyms, that doesn't quite work either because even though the meaning is similar, that word doesn't appear. So but what do we do about this? I'm gonna copy that query. That's where semantic search or vector search comes in. Let's try a semantic search equivalent of this exact query. Um, I'm going to say near text. And let's comment that out for now. And here's where our vector definition comes in. Remember when we defined our collection, we added a uh, name, vector for, name vector for the title, so we can search our titles, or we can search the all text field. So let's try just searching against the title. And if I run that search and get results, so it's a little bit unpredictable how this thing's gonna zoom in, but hopefully this is clear. Um, so the first title that we get back is in the mood for love. And even though the query term amorous didn't appear anywhere in the title, we've got a pretty good result back. And as we go down, we get love actually, and even scent of a woman, uh, the old Al Pacino movie, right? And it's done a pretty good job of comparing our query term against the results um, in terms of meaning and getting us the right results back. At the moment, yeah, exactly, exactly. So it's comparing under the hood. Um, so that's actually a good, good point to maybe now recap what's happening under the hood, right? So what we're doing is to send this text-based query to Weaviate. There's no vectors involved, at least from the user end, right? So what Weaviate is doing is to convert this text um, for Amorous, Amorous into a vector using the nomic embedding model. And then it gets that vector or for Amorous, and compares that against what's in the database, all the vectors in the database. Gets the best results and sends it back to us. Um, 
and, and what the vector that it's comparing is the title vector of, um, of our object. So if I change that to get, compare against all text, we're going to get slightly different results. Interestingly, now the top result is Moulin Rouge. So the title is from the title itself. It's probably not very close to our query word. But just um, <laughs> the overview, the description of the movie, if you've seen Moulin Rouge, is a you know, classic kind of like love story musical, right? So that matches very well against our query, and that's why it is now the top result. And the same thing with this other movie, which I'm not familiar with either. But again, you can see from the description, that description talks about someone being love-stricken and so on, which matches Monica very well. Bellucci. Sorry? Monica Bellucci, Monica really? Yes. One which... of my favorite uh, movies from her. Really? Ah. I was going to say, would you recommend it then? Yes. Fantastic. I will. I'll put that on the list. Thank you. <laughs> see, it's good to have, like, you know, fellow movie lovers in the audience. Um, so that is an example of semantic search. And if you want to have a look at, sorry, some of my shortcuts are not working on Jupyter and it's a little bit annoying, but that's okay. Let's have a look at some of our metadata. So before we looked at scores for BM25 searches, and now let's have a look at the distance. And of course they did. Um, I, well, I did warn you about typos. So <laughs> now we can have a look at distance in our results. And we get slightly different scores, and base, but what you're seeing here is that the top results have the smallest distance to the query, so it's the closest together in meaning. And the numbers itself doesn't matter so much, but the fact is, the, the important thing is that it is measuring something by vector distance, and that's what we mean by distance in that context. So it's, if you think of it as a complement of uh, similarity, that's basically what that is. Can I yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, I was going to gloss over that, but we can talk about it. So with a vector database, so again, are you familiar with SQL type databases? Yeah, so in a SQL database, you might choose to index particular columns, right, to speed up search. Um, vector databases have a vector index to do the same thing. Um, and that's because if you can imagine comparing, you know, 1,000, 2,000 numbers against each other, it's quite expensive. So as your database grows in scale, um, you need a way to speed that up. And so vector databases have that, um, have that uh, data structure. And incidentally, um, that makes the vector databases, that's probably the most memory hungry part of a vector database typically. So yeah, really good question, thank you. All right. So as we talked about, under the hood, this uses vector search. Um, and as we did before, oops, uh, I, went ahead a little bit, inspect the similarity of results along with the results themselves. So let's skip that part of it. So this is what a vector, uh, how a vector search works. And actually, if we want to, we can even get, I'm just going to go back, sorry. I'm just going to go back and get our query so we can look at vectors. It's very, very exciting, I promise. Um, So along with our results, we can say include vector true. So this is just a um, optional parameter that I can pass or optional argument. And then if I do that, and if I haven't messed anything up, there we go. Vector, there we go. Um, you can see that, as promised, there's a bunch of very boring numbers that you can look at and, um, you know, they're not going to mean anything to you or me, right? You're not going to look at floats and go, oh, that should be 0.084, not 0.83. But if you do want to export the vectors back out or do some sort of comparisons, you can get the vectors back out if you want to. Um, so they, that might be handy. But you're not going to certainly inspect them by hand because they're just going to be a thousand floats. So these vectors um, talk, come from deep learning models. So again, you saw that we use the nomic model. There's a bunch of other models available. You can use commercial providers like Cohere, you know, OpenAI, um, so on. Like, and there's a 
hundreds of models available at, on Hugging Face. You can use any of them, just um, and, and, and you can select a model that best suits your use case, perhaps languages, and so on. So some models are multilingual. So if you have a data set, if you're, let's say, an e-commerce provider, you might have user comments in many, many different languages, then you might want a multilingual data set so you can just embed them all into one space. Um, if you have images as well as whatever, you can, can use a multimodal data set. So you can turn images, even videos, into vectors. You can, you can search across them too, which is really cool. Um, and you know, if you're uh, building a medical database or medical rag bot, you can have a model that's fine-tuned for medical purposes as well, so based on the medical corpus. So that's very, very powerful. Cool. Um, OK, so we've got about half an hour to go. I think this is kind of a natural place to pause for at least a couple of seconds and see where we're at. Do you have any questions at the moment? It's a really good question. Um, it really depends on a few different things. Um, when you say performance difference, are you thinking about like generally which one's faster kind of thing? Right. Um, they're both, they can, they can both be very, very fast. So I'll say that from our perspective, we have users with literally billions of objects in their database, um, again, in a distributed kind of system. And yeah, their, their searches can be very performant. Right, but the the things that are bottlenecks in vector search are not the same things that are bottlenecks in keyword search, and vice versa. So it's kind of difficult to say. But they can both be performant, um, and we haven't talked about hybrid search yet. But in hybrid search, using both, so they both need to be uh, in need to be performant. Cool. Uh, yep. Yes and no. Um, so the vector search itself is deterministic. Um, it, so we talked about vector indexes a little bit, right? So the most popular type of an index is uh, what's called an HNSW index. Um, and the reason I mentioned that is that to build it's a, um, a layered graph structure to perform kind of approximate index searching to speed it up. Why am I going on about this? Um, building that graph is slightly non-deterministic because the, that's the approximate part of approximate, approximate nearest neighbors. Um, so there's like a slight non-deterministic aspect of it. Um, but, and also, depending on your parameters, um, the approximateness means you lose some recall versus doing brute force searching. So I'll try and summarize my answer which is vector search, if you do a brute force search one by one, that would be deterministic and perfect, but it's very slow because you you know, have a 10 million, 100 million objects, you're going to compare them one by one by one, right? Doesn't scale. So typically in the field, you use approximate nearest neighbor searching, and that comes with it some performance penalties um, in terms of you need lots of RAM, um, and there's a little bit of loss in recall because it's approximate. And the graph building process is slightly, very, very slightly non-deterministic. Um, not in a way that it really matters, though. Cool. I hope that answers your questions. Yeah. Cool. OK. Um, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay, really good question. Um, and that's a good segue for me to actually get into VS Code and somewhere where I can actually get help from an IDE. <laughs> that's also less stressful for me too. All right. So this is the project repo that if you do uh, try the project at home, that you'll, you'll see. There's a few different files to it, but if you do follow the readme, I'm just going to close all these files. Um, if you do follow the readme, you're going to get a bunch of files that you see on the left-hand side. Um, this one file that I'm going to look at is called create collection. And here, you'll see a few different aspects like um, 
uh, configuring the vector index, and hopefully that's big enough. But you'll see here that I'm configuring on HNSW vector index. And in this method, you see a bunch of parameters in here, right? And one of them, hopefully this pop-up stays where it is, is distance metric. So this distance metric defines how the vector distance is calculated between the source, uh, sorry, between the query vector and the result. So typically, with most models, you use cosine. Um, in practice, like for example in VV8, the vectors are normalized and we use dot distance because it's faster. But it's the same thing, right, because it's normalized. Um, so that's what we use. And what determines you know, which metric to use is a question of how was that model trained, right? Because you obviously want to have a loss function that op is uh, set for a particular distance to minimize. So tip, the most common one is cosine. And I've not heard of too many cases where someone's gone, oh, I've used the cosine distance and that really you know, broke recall or whatever. So cosine is the most common one and, and you really can't go wrong with that. that. Does that answer your question? Okay, fabulous. Cool. So if you do play along at home um, and look at the app, this is the app um, that we'll, we'll play with. So the, what we're gonna do here is a similar thing to what we did on a Jupyter Notebook. I've got two Python scripts. One is called create collection and the other one's called add vectors. So if you go through the readme file, this will be kind of set up for you so you can inspect it. But all it does is not, it's not that many lines of code because again, this is all uh, commented out code so you can have a look at alternatives. So let's delete that um, just for this purpose. So it's only, you know, 40 odd lines of code. And what it, what it does is to connect to EV8 I've got a vector configuration and I've just got it set up as a variable here because so, I reuse it. And then we're doing the same, same similar kinds of things that we did in our Jupyter Notebook. So we're configuring explicitly configuring the properties. Um, and in this case, what we're doing is using a data set of support chats on Twitter between, a, uh, I guess, Twitter support person, back when people used to be on, on Twitter, um, and users. And I'm just capturing the text, who the author is, when was it created, and so on. And just like we did before, creating vectors for the text and the text with metadata. So metadata like the company name. But everything else here is basically the same. So if I run this script, it's gonna create that collection on my database. And now the next on the next script, what I'm gonna do is to add my data to VB8. So again, it's another 40 lines of code and a bunch of it is just me uh, doing error um, handling and printing a bunch of stuff out. But all this does is to import data from a pre-populated data file. And in this particular instance, I've run it um, on my machine and exported the objects and, dat and the vectors. So, this means you don't have, like, when you run it yourself, this would be very, very fast because you you're not generating the vectors, you're just sending the existing vectors along with the payload to VV8. So I'm gonna run this, and I think this will be 100,000 objects or so. And remember we did uh, like 1,000 objects on the Jupyter Notebook and it took about, I don't know, 30 seconds or a minute. And you can see how fast this is going, right? It's inserting about 2,000, 2,500 objects a second. Um, and that's because the bottleneck typically is the vector generation part. Um, so you can do this, uh, if you copy the notebook and do it at home, um, it's set up to download the file for you and you can just run this script and you should see similar kinds of speed. And in just about a minute or so, we'll have ingested 100,000 objects into VV8 and that's what we'll be using on our database. Cool, am I running? Yeah, cool, I'm running the app. Okay, so that's what our app is. And if we have a look at our memory usage, because we're building an index at the time, uh, currently, we're actually using quite a bit of memory and that's just me capturing the memory footprint of Weaviate Live. So this is 
uh, pulling the memory footprint at the moment and just printing it. So as it's building the index and ingesting data, the memory footprint is high, and it's actually going to go down as we run this demo once it's done and it, the garbage collector does its thing. And you can see it going down already, so down to about 500 megs or so. Okay, so also this data is live, so you can see that now we've got 100,000 objects. Um, these are the most common accounts whose data we've captured. And I've got the nice front end set up so that we don't have to, uh, you know, sit here and um, write the front end live as well. But at the moment, uh, we don't see any results. Why is that? Well, that's because I've set it up so that we can perform the search part of it, or at least add the search functionality live. And let's see if we can do that. Cool. So the app is set up here. Um, have you used Streamlit before? Can I get a show of hands if you've used Streamlit? Literally zero people. Oh, wow, that's pretty cool. So, oh, one person, thank you. <laughs> um, if you haven't used Streamlit, it's a, I would say it's an easy to use framework for building um, basically demo apps, but also just very easy um, visualization apps so you can interact with your data. So I use it a lot for demos. Um, some people do use it in production for internal dashboards and things like that. Um, it's a really, really cool app. Um, I would highly encourage it, uh, you to check it out if you, if you have that sort of need. And as a Python person, it means I don't have to deal with front-end things or <laughs> very little. Uh, I have to deal with front-end things very little using Streamlit because it takes care of all of that for me. So that makes me very happy. Okay, so what I'm trying to say there is that you'll see a lot of boilerplate code in this app, but really all we need to change is um, one part of our code. And what that, where that is, is just here. I've got this function called weviate query. And I'm just importing that from another file uh, called helpers.py. So if I click through on my ID, You'll see that it takes a bunch of parameters, um, but I've deliberately not implemented any of this so we can do it together. So let's see how we go. Um, one parameter that it takes is a company filter, right? So on our front end, um, I'll just move that here. On our front end, we take some sort of wildcard so I can filter my customer support results by our company name. So let's implement that. So if we have a company filter parameter, I'm going to say filter by, and it's nice to actually get the um, ID help here, isn't it? And that's almost correct. Thanks, Copilot. <laughs> like company filter. So that's kind of very similar to what we built together in the Jupyter Notebook. And what I'm going to do is select the search type. And that's going to t take into account my input here based on what well, do I want a hybrid search, do I want a vector search, or do I want a keyword search. By doing, and then to do that, um, I would say 0.5, um, user alpha factor at 0.5, or if I want a pure vector search, I would make that one. And it basically just weighs what um, type of search do I want to be weighed more strongly. And I've got two partial queries here because I've set up this wrapper function so that if I, have a, if I want to perform a rag query, it's going to run a slightly different method. So let's give that a go. Um, I'm going to say search response is if it's just not, if it doesn't have a rag query in it, I just want to do a search. So I can say collection dot query, oops. hybrid, and I can basically match up these parameters to pass on from the parameters that I pass from my wrapper function. So my query will be query, um, and remember these are the inputs that I'm passing on. And I'm going to say filter is that filter, 
alpha is our alpha we've defined up here. Uh, I have a limit so that it just returns a set number of objects. And that again is just passed straight on from this. And that should be it. If I want to perform retrieval augmented generation with it, um, I haven't shown that in the notebook, but it's basically the same. The syntax is very, very similar. So let's copy that and show you how that changes. All I would change to perform retrieval augmented generation is to change this namespace in VB8 to generate. So I've gone from query up here to generate, and the search that powers the rag aspect of it remains the same in the Python client. Um, it's just that it's set up slightly differently. And what that gives me is another set of parameters. So you can say group task equals rag query. And if you remember, hey, what is rag doing? We talked about it being the same as just retrieving the results from our database and sending it to a language model along with our prompt. This helper method with Weavia just does that for you. So you can do it all within Weavia in the framework of using Weavia without having to uh, wrap, that, wrap those functions yourself. Um, so once I've done that, that should hopefully work. And let's see if I can rerun that function. And I've got an error. Oh, I have to have a target vector, excuse me. And our target vector would be text, I think. So that should be one of these vectors should be my target. So we've defined two target vectors, so I can either search just the text of our support chat, or if I want the company name or whatever other metadata to be considered in my vector search, I can include that. But in this case, um, let's just search by the text. And once I add this, I can go back, rerun the query. There we go, we've got our searches working now. Um, so I don't want to just pick on Amazon, but let's have a look at Delta. Um, and if I have a look at something like delay, we can see, hey, um, we can start to aggregate or see what types of conversations people have had with Delta support person on Twitter about delays. So this person says, oh, I had a three hour delay. Um, they're very sad, just want to go home. It's not ideal. And you can even go broader. So if you want to say, oh, I want to see what kind of problems people have had, this will basically just capture all the objects in our support database where people have either specifically mentioned the word problem or just you know some areas where they're unhappy, right? Because I'm using a hybrid search. It'll take both vector and keyword search into account. And performing, uh, so and then using that data that I've retrieved, because you can see from here that I've got many, many rows of data, I can start to manipulate those results. I can say things like uh, list briefly some of the specific issues the users have had here. Please be brief. So now I'm interacting with the language model that I've defined in Weaviate. So what language model is that interacting with? Um, it's this model in, excuse me, in our collection that we've defined, and that's a two billion parameter Gemma 2 model. And I think it's quite impressive. It's a pretty small model as far as, you know, language models go, um, but it does quite well. So here are, you know, some of the, here, here's the output that the model has generated for us. So it says, oh yeah, there's information about delayed flights or issues with aircraft. Um, oh, these are actually different type of problems with the boarding zone and so on, customer service. So you can start to see how much manual work that would save you in terms of trawling through all of these objects and um, transforming the retrieved data to do something with it. Does that make sense so far? Do you have any questions? No, it's all good. 
Um, another thing I want to point out is that the memory footprint here was we're down to about 300 megabytes for our 10,000, 100,000 objects. It's pretty neat. And this is another area where you would have some flexibility in terms of how you scale. Um, I mentioned before that some of our users have literally billions of objects, right? And so I've got about 100,000 objects and a billion would be 10,000 times that. And that could potentially mean that my footprint, memory footprint is, you know, 10,000 times 300 megs, which is three terabytes, is that right? It's a lot of RAM. Um, and so you might not want to deal with it, deal with that. So you maybe you want to think about some strategies to mitigate it. I'm already using one of those strategies, which is quantization. Um, who's familiar with quantization at all? Some, somewhat, okay. Um, I with, is that from a vector context or model context that you've heard about? Model context, yeah. Um, so then you would have heard the, about quantization in terms of making the model smaller so that it runs faster and it, you know, it doesn't require as much RAM or memory to run, right? Because they're very, very big, very memory hungry things. You can perform quantization in the context of vector databases as well. So here, the one of, another reason that I've got my index set up this way is that I can show you different options for quantization. I could, as an example, have all of these quantization options grayed out, and I'm gonna run this and let's see what happens. So I'll create the collection, and I'm gonna in, run the data ingestion again. So it'll take, whatever, 30 seconds or so. But these quantization options give you another uh, parameter to tune so that you can trade off your model accuracy or retrieval precision against uh, the resource consumption. But what it's doing is to change the precision of the vectors that's stored and used in the vector database. So these three options that I show here are BQ, SQ, and PQ, and they stand for binary quantization, scalar quantization, and product quantization. So they all differ different uh, in terms of how much it quantizes the data, but also obviously if you're reducing the precision of the data, right, then you're gonna lose some recall accuracy. So let's go back. That's what I always find difficult. What's the trade-off? How much will you lose? Yeah, and, and there's a couple of different uh, things to consider. One is um, oh, maybe I'll go through the options very, very quickly and what they mean. So this is BQ, and BQ means uh, binary quantization. So in BQ, we remember we talked about vectors being 1,000 to 3,000 floats. It turns each float into a binary entry, so a zero or a one. Um, I often call it, I can't believe this works, quantization method, because you lose so much information, right? Um, but there's, I think there's a couple of things that help it out because the dimensionality is so high, you get a you know, 1,000 to 3,000, so you still have binary to the power of 1,000 to 3,000 space to store information in, that's very helpful. And another thing is that uh, when you use a vector database like this, you overfetch, right, as in if, so if you use a cell, I want top five objects. If you're using BQ, you might actually grab the top 20 objects, and the top, and what you do is then use the full vectors to rescore and that gives you quite a good recall and you lose you know, typically just a few single percentage in recall results. So that's BQ. And SQ is similar, but instead of turning uh, each dimension into a binary number, you turn it into a scalar or integer, right? So you lose less information that way. And we've got PQ, which is the most perhaps complex and more flexible of all. So if I hover over this PQ method, you see there's quite a few parameters I can tune. So I won't go through all of the details of it, but it basically performs quantization in terms of reducing the number of dimensions. So you have a shorter vector, and each number, going, it goes from a float to a, an integer, essentially, of um, your definition, of your choosing. And there's some clever clustering going on in there, so it doesn't just reduce one number into uh, another less precise number, but essentially you might be grouping six floats into 
one uh, number and you're doing clustering so that they get intelligently grouped together. So that's PQ. Let's have a look at our memory footprint again um, now that it is quantized. So this is, I think, the data, yeah, before quantization, we were at about 300 megabytes. And now, look, it's going to go down because it is slightly high when indexing, but we were at about 1.3 gigabytes and we've gone down to one gig. It's probably going to go down a little bit more, um, but you can see already it's making a, quite a big difference between when I had highly quantized information to using, um, you know, not quantized information. So that's definitely one strategy that you can use. Um, I won't get too much into some of the other methods, but there's other methods such as multi-tenancy, where if you want to isolate your end user's data, you can actually separate them into different indexes altogether. And that allows you freedom to do things like move some of that data into between uh, memory and disk. So that it's only live in memory when they are uh, say logged in or they're using it, right? And otherwise it can just be stored on disk and not taking up valuable memory space. So let's stop there. I've got about eight minutes left, um, but you know, it's a long session. It's getting to the afternoon. I'm glad that no one's fallen asleep. Um, so let's stop there. Um, again, if you want to check out more of the, um, the workshop or if you want to go through it yourself, um, this is the repository. So it's we v 8 tutorials slash workshop OSS. Um, I've tried to make the readme relatively detailed so you can get through, uh, through it from start to finish. And if you just find a VV8 tutorials repository, um, you should be able to find this because I think it's, I'm pretty sure GitHub uh, organizations are sorted by like most, most recent commits by default, right? So you should be able to find that if you're interested. Um, so that's it. And that's it all from me as far as the schedule programming goes. Um, I don't know if you have any questions. Yeah. What are the challenges you are still trying to figure out how to address it? Like the latency. Do you mean as, as, a, as a, like from a WeVA product level? Yes. Okay. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, or, or generally, just in terms of the vector uh, versus traditional search. I think the space is evolving really quickly, so there's definitely lots of room to improve. Uh, one area that's been of recent focus is perhaps adjacent to the ML side of things, which is going to production. So it's really the aspect of having a robust, scalable, distributed database side of things, right? So if you're, you know, we talked, mentioned Mongo before, um, they're an incumbent. Um, they, you know, obviously went through those pains. Um, so from our perspective, our users are really happy with how we scale. That's like one of the things we're really proud of, right? In terms of using using our product. But you know, um, so we're making, but we're still making a lot of improvements in terms of having our data, uh, have, having our database scale like out as well as scale up. Having things like uh, replication features that kind of work for everybody because everyone's use case is a little bit different. And multi-tenancy is has been like a recent development for us, um, but that's really given us a lot of flexibility. So I don't talk about it too much in these intro workshops, but when I talk about when we have multi-tenancy, it really catered towards production use cases. So if you're running a big SaaS type product through Weave, yeah, you have lots of end users, right? You might have thousands, tens of thousands of users, but they're not all logged on at the same time. So to have all of them on memory using up, you know, hundreds of gigabytes of memory all, all together is very, very expensive. So how do you manage those types of use cases so that the storage costs are used, so storage resources are used most efficiently, efficiently um, in terms of memory and, and, but also have them be available readily. That's, uh, that's a big challenge and, and one that I think we're sort of really improving very rapidly at. Um, 
and and another one is also a slightly different topic that I think is important is the dichotomy of model improvements versus these like you know improvements in the latest rag practices too. Um, I get the question quite often of hey will vector databases still be useful as the context windows get larger and I don't I mean I, I personally think it'll vector databases will have their use and I don't think it's a great idea to just like throw a ton of data at a large context model but we don't really know what might happen a few years down the line right um, I think as I mentioned before if you just throw lots of data at a large context model it tends to kind of forget like the stuff in the middle tends to get lost so that's a problem um, and also the RAG workflow has changed a lot in the, even in the last year and evolved a lot so there's lots of use cases with like tool use different agents and how that integrates with vector database is really interesting um, I did a talk like a couple of weeks ago where I put a demo together with agents so it wasn't just doing simple retrieval but I gave an agent different tool like the tools to do searches when it needed to do further searches on top of like the basic rag context and that was like really interesting thing for me to try out it worked quite well too um, but how all that integrates with vector databases as a best practice thing um, in a couple of years yeah I don't know <laughs> it's really interesting yep Did you want? Did you say you want to store the quality, or you want to evaluate? Got, so I have a data crawler. Yep. Got a, got a lot of specific information inside my database. Yes, and I need to score the quality of the information. Oh, that's interesting. Give the, like say, the analyst. The, yep. The best information that he can get <coughs> as quick response to, in my case, an incident, as example. Oh, okay. So I guess you know, if you're just doing a search on like a big database, that's a typical so vector database use case but if you want to perhaps go another level um, another use case for vector database might be to do what we call um, uh, generate generative feedback loop and what I mean by that is that you might envisage a case where you can get a language model right to look through your data entry and say hey is this high quality medium quality low quality type thing or basically have something like that and save that information to a vector database. There is no low level of quality at the moment. Right. Um, I don't know. I guess maybe, I guess what I'm sort of going with, the, with that idea was if you could have a training set for, you know, some, something that could evaluate your data quality based on your metrics, and perhaps you can generate that data and add that to your vector database. Because there, there's two problems, right? One is, semantic searching s solves one of them which is how do you find the most similar objects to my query and then there's a second problem which you're referring to which is well the words kind of are there but this is bad information and to from off the top of my head it kind of sounds as though that might be another dimension that perhaps you can use a tradition either, either a traditional ml model or a large language model to help encode and save to a vector database Right, so you can imagine if you had some sort of, if, if it was possible to have a rating for each entry on a, on a scale of one to 10, and you can start to filter that and then use semantic search for similarity-based searching. Just one thought. Okay, I understand. So I, I will, will uh, after information, as example, I put it in a vector database, uh, make my searches <coughs> against the model. There are some Olama models still out. Yeah. All my information. And get back the result into my database and then I make some uh, algorithm with my machine learning, whatever algorithm I still have. Yeah, or, or even the other way around, if you can get your algorithm earlier to score every object and then, okay, I don't know how many objects it may be a lot, um, but you can save that as another another column or property in your vector database. In my case, it's a CTI information. Okay. Right, right. So could be interesting. I mean, we can, if you'd like, we can have a conversation afterwards too. Could be interesting. Yeah. Hey, yeah, go for it.
Yeah, that's a really, really good question, and that's the difficulty. I'll say it like this. Um, have you seen this recent thing where people are like testing, is my blue your blue thing? It's like a viral thing that's been going around. Uh, the reason I bring that up is semantic search is such that, you know, if I say to someone, is that cream or beige? Like there's no hard boundary, right? Like it's similar to some extent, but you can't really, wherever you draw that boundary is going to be arbitrary. And Vector search is basically that because everything's to everything's similar to some extent. So typical use people, uh, typical way people solve this problem is to say, okay, we have our model, we have our data set, we can have our experts look at it and say, okay, about this number is where we think the threshold is. So we'll kind of like cut it off there, based on like some sort of human judgment. Like the distance then, yeah, distance. Yeah. Um, or we can have both too. So you can say, get if someone uh, on e-commerce search is an example, right? If a user performs a search, if the um, search engine could be configured to give them the top 25 results, let's say, but only if the distance is above this minimum threshold, then that might be like human calibrated. So that, you know, if someone searches, if someone goes to a, uh, e-commerce store that sells sports stuff and searches for pets. It doesn't like give them, you know, a bunch of sports stuff that's not related to pets, right? So that might be an example where you have a limit, so it serves them a set number of results, but also use a threshold so that if it's a bad match, just don't serve anything at all. I think for a given model and a given data set, you probably can use something like that. Um, but it's, it's hard to say because the numbers themselves don't mean a lot. So even if, again, in that e-commerce example, like an acceptable threshold, let's say you're Amazon, because they have everything, right? If you're Amazon, and then an acceptable threshold in electronics might not be an acceptable threshold in pets, right? So it's, it's kind of hard to tell. Um, because the numbers are, you know, it's a little bit like whose line is it anyway, like everything's made up or the numbers are made up so it doesn't have any absolute meaning. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> cool. Um, anyone else? Yep. It's definitely a, a challenge because it's, you know, yeah, it's, it's a little bit like going from a completely different, you're going to a different language, basically. Um, so you have to re-embed all of your data set. I think the current embedding models are very, very good. Um, and like, let's see, if we use um, OpenAI, for example, uh, they had this model called ADA002, and that was basically what a lot of people use for a number of years. So you're not going to be changing your embedding model every six months or so, but you might be changing it once every few years if you want to. And I think the model providers are also cognizant of that too. If you have a billion objects and you have to re-embed all of them, that's not a trivial cost at all. Um, so yeah, it is a factor, but I don't think they change nearly as fast as say large language models. Uh, yeah, at the back. Um, a quick question here. Uh, how uh, do you mix between uh, the full text search and the vector search results? So, yeah, a really good question. Um, I haven't covered that in detail, but basically that's what we do in um, this hybrid search query. And what happens under the hood is two searches are performed, and there's two different what we call fusion algorithms as to how those two result sets emerge because they're two parallel searches. Um, one way to think about it is like we have this alpha parameter that says one is pure vector search, zero is pure keyword search and gets merged. Um, but there's different 
research out there as to what the best way to merge those ranks are. At the moment, the default is to um, normalize the search scores, and then they get combined, and you get like a, yeah, normalized score. Yeah, cool. No worries. Okay, uh, I think I'm over time, so I should probably wrap up. Um, thank you so much for sticking around. I know it's uh, afternoon and it's a long day, so I appreciate your attendance and uh, questions. It was lovely.